Today I'm going to show you how I scan my 35mm film photographs at home. I'm going to cover the process that is known as DSLR scanning, so scanning with a digital camera. I'll be explaining why I chose this method, what you'll need and how I do it. Let's begin. So the way you scan film is you use a device that can digitally capture the image that is on your negative. To do this you basically have a choice of two different devices, a scanner or a digital camera. In both cases the device will capture the negative digitally, so basically it takes a picture of the picture, so that on the computer you can then turn the image of the negative into a positive image. I think labs mostly use scanners, and as far as I know scanners are the best way to scan your film for the highest quality digital file. However, I chose to use a camera. Instead of inserting your film into a scanner, you can backlight it and photograph the negative with a macro lens and convert that image to a positive. The reason I chose this method is firstly the cost and secondly the speed. Scanners can become really expensive depending on the quality you're aiming for and seeing as I already had a digital camera, I thought it's probably cheaper for me to just go with this method. However, the speed was actually the bigger reason for me. As I was doing my research and watching a couple tutorials on scanning, it seemed quite clear that any affordable scanner will be really slow and even the expensive ones are not going to be fast. The DSLR method, on the other hand, is not speedy, but definitely a good bit faster than the scanners and so this and the cost made my choice quite clear. So that is the method that I'm going to be showing you now. Let's start with the preparation and go over what you're going to need. To scan your film with your digital camera, you're of course going to need a digital camera. I scan my photos with my Sony a7 III. To position the camera above the negative, you're going to need either a stand or a tripod. If you've got cash to spend, this is the cool way to do it, however I'm trying to keep my costs down and therefore I do this with my tripod. So I'm not sure if all tripods are generally capable of doing this, but with mine it is like this that I can flip this switch and then I can just invert my tripod basically by flipping over the legs. So then I can open this here like that and I can extend the legs down here now and have the camera hanging. Then you're going to need a light table to backlight your film evenly. There are all sorts of these in the market. I have one from Kaiser and it's doing its job well. Then you're going to need a film holder. You can technically just lay your film on the table and photograph it, however that only works when your film is really flat. Especially when I shoot expired film, it's all curly so that would never work. And also it's just a more precise workflow with a holder that reliably holds your film flat. I used to scan with the Lomography Digitalizer, however I would only recommend this if you're on a really tight budget. I bought mine second hand for 20 euros. It does what it should, but not very well I must admit. It's quite flimsy and scanning curly film with this system is an absolute pain. And also I really often got some weird light reflections or light leak kind of things in my photos from this holder which were a pain to work around. Therefore I was really hoping to find a different solution and I found this thing which is called the Essential Film Holder. You can buy this from its creator Andrew from his website. Please don't be discouraged by the web design, it looks old, kind of sketchy, and the PayPal buy now button definitely looks like a scam, but the website is legit, I got mine within a couple weeks. The holder is quite a bit more expensive than the Lomography holder and currently costs 73 British pounds, however there are other high end options out there that were so much more expensive that this is basically the mid ground. Anyway, I'm really happy with this holder now and will keep it. Then, there is one last piece of gear that is important. To get close enough to your negative, you're going to want a macro lens. Now this is not absolutely necessary, but highly recommended. You can try scanning with a non-macro lens, but you will probably lose a lot of resolution because you cannot get close enough to your negative. I try to get as close as possible to the negative so that I max out the resolution I can get with my Sony's 24 megapixel sensor. If you have a Sony a7R4 with I don't know how many but a lot of megapixels, this might not be necessary because you can shamelessly crop your scan to an extent that I don't even feel comfortable with. However, in my case I needed some method of getting the most out of my Sony a7III's sensor. But due to my budget, I was not willing to buy a macro lens and so I tried one of those macro adapters. 
It's basically just a tube that adds some distance between your sensor and the lens, which decreases the minimum focusing distance and effectively turns your normal lens into a macro lens. Now, I don't know if mine was just way too cheap or something, but it was not working for me. I did get much closer to the negative, but I lost a lot of sharpness, which for scanning is not so advantageous. But even worse, I got chromatic aberration on my scans, and so I knew this was still not going to be my long-term solution. And then came some luck, you could say. I was gifted my girlfriend's grandfather's film camera kit, which he didn't need anymore. That kit included this Mamiya Secor 60mm macro lens, and so I then had a macro lens. But it's a vintage lens with an M42 mount, which is not going to screw onto my Sony a7 III, but I found a way to combine the two nevertheless. This here is a lens adapter. It's basically just a tube with a different mount on each end, so this side is the M42 mount and this side is a Sony E mount, which then allows me to connect the two mounts. The adapter I bought is from a brand called Earth, which are also the sponsor of today's video. Earth is a company for photographers that offers all sorts of accessories such as camera straps, ND filters, and the piece of gear I was looking for, lens adapters. So thanks to this adapter, I didn't have to buy a macro lens, which my wallet appreciated, and since then, this has been my way of scanning. In fact, I'm so happy with this solution that I asked Earth if they'd like to sponsor the video, and they said yes, so let me just briefly tell you a little bit more about the adapter and Earth. Something I was honestly positively surprised by is the build quality. It feels more expensive than it costs thanks to its heavy, hardened aluminium. The usability is flawless. I screw the adapter onto the lens and then the both of them onto the camera. Earth has a bunch of variations of these adapters for all sorts of combinations, so you can check out their choice on their online shop. One more thing I would like to point out about the brand Earth is their efforts for sustainability. Their products and packaging are made very consciously and additionally they plant five trees for each purchase. So I'm really happy that I found this solution and that I could even get them onto the channel as a partner. So if you're ever in need of lens adapters, I highly recommend checking out Earth. I'll leave a link in the description. Big thank you to Earth for supporting the channel. So that covers everything I use for scanning. I've made this table here with the costs so that you can see for yourself how the costs vary depending on what gear you already have. So because I already had a camera, a tripod, and by luck got a vintage macro lens, that made my setup cost about 200 euros. If you buy a digital macro lens, that is going to significantly increase this cost. So if you don't have a macro lens, I think getting a vintage macro lens and adapting it is probably the way to go because you can find those for a smaller cost than the new ones. Anyway, now that I've thoroughly explained the tools for the setup, let's continue with how the scanning process works. So, before scanning, I always gather everything I need for my setup. I lay the light table on the table and plug it in. Then I've got my camera with the adapter and the macro lens on my tripod pointing up. And then fold my tripod so that the head is looking down. This is where you need to be precise. You want the camera to look down vertically as straight as possible to have the same angle as the negative. You can use a level to help you here, however I don't have one and just do it by the eye. Then, I place my film holder right below my lens and slide in my first strip of film that I want to scan. Now comes the next part which you need to do meticulously, and that is setting the focus. This lens has really heavy focus breathing, and so it can take quite some time to find the right distance between the lens and the negative. What I'm aiming to do is be as close as possible to the negative to capture maximum detail without actually being so close that I'm cutting off part of the frame. This is usually a process of about 5 to 10 minutes of focusing, repositioning the camera, refocusing and repositioning the camera again, until I find the perfect balance. I do all this at f4, but then once I've found my balance and set the focus, I close the aperture to f16 to ensure that the frame is sharp throughout the scanning process. Once I've set the aperture, I then set my ISO and shutter speed. Of course, it is recommended to keep your ISO as low as possible to minimize any digital noise from your camera. However, I usually don't mind shooting anywhere between ISO 200 and 400 because on this camera, those noise values are just not noticeable. And so then, I just set the shutter speed accordingly, which is usually about 2 seconds long. When deciding what shutter speed to use, try to slightly overexpose the photo. This is important for the software part later, when we convert the negative to a positive. 
So I always just keep an eye on the histogram on the camera display so that I can see that I'm exposing quite brightly but without clipping anything. Due to this long shutter speed and the close distance to the subject, I also have a 5 second timer set to make sure that I don't get any camera shake while shooting. And then one last thing before you actually begin to shoot and that is darken your room. If you have bright light sources in the wrong angle you might end up getting reflections on your negatives, so I usually just turn off all the lamps and darken any daylight. And now you can shoot. I always have my negatives lying beside me and take out a strip, shoot a photo of each negative and then move on to the next strip until I'm done. After scanning all my negatives, it is time to bring those files to the computer and convert them to positives. There are many ways you can do this, so people with a scanner usually have a software from that scanner that is capable of the conversion, however I obviously do not have that possibility and so I just import those raw files into Lightroom. Here you now have two ways to do this. The first method is the free one, but it's a very tedious one. The first step is to set your white balance by using the white balance selector and selecting the edge of the film. Then you go to the curves and go to each color channel and invert the curve. Now you can see we've got a positive, but the colors are completely wild. The next step is to pull the end of each curve to about where the histogram begins to rise. When you do that with all the channels, you will see that this is looking remotely like a proper photograph. And from here, you basically just have to fine tune each curve until the photo looks the way you want it to look. With black and white, it's different. First, you set the white balance again, but then you set the photo to black and white. Next, in the curves, there is no need to go into each color channel. You can use the standard curve, invert it, and adjust the curve to get the right amount of contrast. So, I guess you understand in what way this is tedious. And therefore, a guy by the name of Nate Johnson has created a Lightroom plugin that speeds up this process. I think you've probably heard of it before because nowadays I think most film photographers use it. I'm talking about Negative Lab Pro. This plugin basically does all the curve work for you, but still lets you have control. So the way I convert my negatives is I first set the white balance again, and then I crop my photo to exclude the edges, which is important for the plugin to better interpret the file. Next, I open the plugin and set the parameters to my liking. So my source is a digital camera. For the color model, I use black and white for black and white photos, obviously, and Noritsu for color. Many like to use Frontier instead, and to be honest, I don't really see a difference. You can set the pre-saturation to your liking. I found that when set to default, the photos often are a bit too desaturated, so I usually have it set to high. And then finally, the border buffer is only necessary if there are still parts of the border in the image, which should not interfere with the conversion. Sometimes I might crop a photo inaccurately and then I set the buffer to 5% or so. And then I press convert negatives. Of course, the plugin often doesn't get the conversion quite right, so I'll do some editing within the software, where you have the basic controls you know from Lightroom, and also you have these sliders to adjust the color in your shadows, mids, and highlights. Lastly, I'll sharpen the image in Lightroom to 100 with masking set to 20. As mentioned, the tedious way is the free way, whereas the plugin, I believe you get 12 free conversions to try it out and see whether you like it, and after that you're going to have to buy a lifetime license, which costs $99, so you'll want to consider this when calculating the cost of your scanning setup. So that is how I scan all my negatives. That is the process that I go through with each and every photograph that I always show you in my film photography behind the scenes videos. I tried to include some extra information in this video to not solely explain the exact process I go through, but instead give you ideas of how you could do it differently if you wish to. Anyway, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, I'd appreciate a like. Consider subscribing if you haven't yet. Thank you to each and every one who is supporting me and this channel on Patreon, and I shall see you again next week in the next video. Until then, goodbye.